so uh, why allow Hockey Canada to continue to use uh, non-disclosure agreements after reinstating their funding? Uh, the non-disclosure agreements is something uh, that doesn't only relate to Hockey Canada, but uh, to uh, different uh, sport organizations. So we are looking at ways that we can deal with that question, not only for Hockey Canada, but for all uh, federally funded sport organizations. Uh, we're working on it currently, so we'll come back with more answers about that. Uh, but I'm going to repeat what I've always said. Uh, Non-disclosure uh, agreements should not be used to silence victims uh, of sexual violence, of harassment, uh, violence, or maltreatment in sport. Why not, make that a Why not make that a condition in order for them to receive their funding again then? Like I said, we're going to deal with this question not only with Hockey Canada, but for all Canadian sport organizations. Uh, but we are looking at ways that we can do this in a legal way uh, that protects uh, the athletes and also uh, sometimes non-disclosure agreements are used uh, to protect uh, strategies, team strategies or stuff like that. So we need to, fight, to find the right balance. But like I said, uh, they should never be used to silence uh, victims. En français, en français. En français. Uh, en français, les clauses... Oui, les ententes de non-divulgation. Oui, ok, les... C'est difficile les voir la transition. Donc, en ce qui concerne les ententes de non-divulgation euh, concernant Hockey Canada, c'est une question qu'on ne va pas seulement prendre pour Hockey Canada, mais pour l'ensemble des organisations sportives qui sont soutenues par le gouvernement fédéral. Euh, ce que j'ai toujours dit, c'est que ces clauses-là ne doivent pas être utilisées pour euh, réduire au silence des personnes qui font face à des violences sexuelles, euh, à du harcèlement, à des mauvais traitements dans le monde du sport. Et donc, on regarde la façon de traiter cette question-là pour l'ensemble des fédérations. Une dernière question. What has Hockey Canada done to deserve this federal funding being restored? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that uh, everyone understands that suspending the funding of a sport organization is never a replacement of justice. The goal to that was to send a signal to the management at the time that they no longer had the confidence of the Canadian government, that there needed to be change in their management because the way that they dealt with the stories of 2003 or 2018 and uh, other financial uh, problems that were um, brought to light, uh, that it wasn't appropriate and that changes needed to happen uh, at, in the world of hockey. The two condi conditions that uh, we gave them, one of them, uh, which in my opinion was one of the most important, uh, was to sign with the Office of the Sport Integrity Commissioners to make sure that the independent yeah. mechanism could investigate uh, cases relating to hockey. Uh, so, and from now on, we will be monitoring very closely the organization. It's not a blank check. We're going to make sure that uh, they put uh, their action plan into motion, uh, that they hire a new CEO, that they do everything that they promise to the Canadian population. But, premièrement, je prends toujours les décisions en fonction des athlètes puis du bien-être des athlètes. Le but, ça n'a jamais été de déstabiliser pour toujours euh, l'organisation Hockey Canada. Alors ça, j'ai toujours ça en tête quand je prends les décisions. Maintenant, j'avais mis trois conditions au moment de, de suspendre le financement d'Hockey Canada. Ils ont rempli les trois conditions. Alors, on rétablit le financement avec euh, un suivi qui va être fait euh, régulièrement du côté de Sport Canada pour s'assurer que euh, toutes les conditions ou les recommandations qui avaient été mises dans le rapport de, du juge Cromwell ou dans d'autres rapports qui vont être mises en application à Hockey Canada, non seulement ça, mais dans les prochaines semaines, euh, on va annoncer des changements pour euh, les organisations sportives au Canada, puis Hockey Canada va devoir les respecter également. Merci, Merci beaucoup. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette décision de, de la ministre de, ré, de réinstaurer, le, de réinstaurer oui, de, le budget de Hockey Canada, le financement? Prématuré. Parce que là, quand on pense à l'été passé, euh, Hockey Canada a promis de, de euh, effectivement relâcher toutes les victimes de leurs ententes de non-débolgation. Puis par la suite, Hockey Canada n'a rien fait. Puis là, on, on voit aujourd'hui qu'il reçoit un prix de récompense euh, du gouvernement du Canada qui restaure le financement, même si toutes les obligations et toutes les, les promesses qu'Hockey Canada a fait n'ont pas été remplies. Elle dit qu'ils ont rempli les trois conditions qu'elle qu qu a, qu a rappelées. À, à mon avis, non. Euh, je, je pense que c'est très clair et, et malheureusement, on a un gouvernement fédéral qui n'a pas pris vraiment au sérieux l'obligation d'obliger 
ces organisations sportives nationales de suivre euh, toutes les directives qui viennent de Sport Canada. On a eu comme un laissez-faire attitude depuis longtemps avec Sport Canada. Et puis, malheureusement, je pense que le message qui vient d'être renforcé, c'est faire des promesses comme vous voulez, vous n'êtes pas obligé ou tenez tenu de les, euh, les remplir, ces obligations-là, et le gouvernement fédéral va vous financer quand même. I think it's a, it's a very premature decision. Hockey Canada hasn't uh, met all of the obligations that they've already made. For example, uh, they promised last summer that they would release victims from the non, uh, non-disclosure agreements, uh, which muzzle victims who choose to speak. Victims are not uh, obliged to speak, but if they choose to speak right now, they're muzzled legally. And Hockey Canada hasn't released the victims from this. So uh, we have commitments that have been made by Hockey Canada that have, have uh, promises that haven't been kept. And the reality is, uh, I think the federal government has been very negligent when we talk about national sports organizations. They have not uh, forced national sports organizations to actually put in place actions that protect the public, that protect uh, athletes. And now we have another example of that, the federal government restoring funding, even if, uh, in this case, Hockey Canada hasn't kept its, uh, its promises, kept its commitments. What, what, do you think that the government should have required, I mean, required Hockey Canada to drop these NDAs, and these non-disclosure agreements in, in, in these cases? I, I think the federal government should be saying, here is a very clear, uh, clear obligations that national sports organizations should be meeting. And, and ensure that we no longer are just uh, it, it, this reporting uh, mechanism that is meaningless, that we actually have some teeth to the obligations that national sports organizations have. And one of them, of course, is the non-disclosure agreements. That muzzles victims. Uh, the non-disclosure agreements aren't there to protect the victims, they're there to muzzle victims. And for Hockey Canada, not to release the victims from non-disclosure uh, as, as they committed to it, at, the, at the end of the summer, I, I think shows that Hockey Canada has not fully reformed yet. Uh, I would hope that they would get there. There's been some significant changes in their organization, but they're not there yet. And that's why restoring funding is premature. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. I Oh, totally Hockey surprised, Canada. yeah. Totally surprised that the minister would make that announcement uh, in the past, not only yesterday's gold medal game, but even at the event. Um, they're not there yet, Hockey Canada. Um, so they have $98 million right now in their bank account. Um, they're not in need of federal funding. So... I thought it was a little quick for her to say we're going to restore funding. I get it. They signed on to OSIC. That was one of the requirements. But a lot of sports have signed on to OSIC. They had a deadline, so of course you're going to sign on. But it was way too premature. What would getting there look like in your mind for, for this to... What, like, what bar do they need to meet them if not just signing their names? Well, it's a new board, so let's start there first. And uh, uh, many of them will be replaced by November, too, because uh, they only had a year to get it done. They've made some progress, I will say that. They've made some progress, um, but there's lots more work to be done. I think it was just premature. I really do. I, there was no need to restore the funding. Nobody had their hand out for Hockey Canada. It was the government trying to cover up what they didn't do, I think, in 2018. And that was uh, Sport Canada and the minister at the time should have suspended the funding back then when this allegation started. They didn't do it, and now they're covering up their mistake that they did in 2018. What about the issue of uh, non-disclosure agreements? I mean, should that have been a condition of restoring funding that they drop non-disclosure yeah, agreements? Yeah, absolutely. I'm tired of those non-disclosure agreements, and, and not only in hockey, in every sport that we have in this country. Uh, we're not getting anywhere when you start these non-disclosure agreements and and there's money flowing back and forward. So I would agree that uh, that that should be one of the requisites coming out. Uh, the sport minister should make it available to all 63 national sport organizations that we don't have any of these non-disclosure agreements. I agree with you. And uh, the minister is saying you know, there's still a 
place for non-disclosure agreements in these sports organizations, uh, saying they may need them for things like you know protecting plays. Yeah, just what do you make of that rationale? Weak. Um, no, we don't need non-disclosure agreements. We need everything transparent in sport. We're dealing with safe sport right now. When you have non-disclosure agreements, uh, you're not being transparent. And I think that we have seen that not only in hockey, we've seen it in rugby, we've seen it in soccer, we've seen it in a number of sports. That's part of the problem, I think, right now in sports is everybody runs to a non-disclosure agreement, so you can't talk about it. Right? And that's what safe sport, we're trying to get everyone to open up and talk about this. Well, if you've got a non-disclosure agreement, that shuts it down. So, what good is that doing sport? It isn't doing anything. So, all right, you guys, take care. Hi everyone, it's nice to be back in Ottawa after a couple of weeks back home. There were busy weeks, obviously with a lot of, uh, a lot of festivities with Ramadan, Passover, Easter, Vaisakhi, Sikh Heritage Month. My community even raised a flag for Autism Awareness Month, which I was proud to attend. Uh, I also had the opportunity to visit many, many small businesses, did three school visits, talked to a lot of families, businesses, young people, entrepreneurs about Budget 2023. Talked about healthcare a lot. We talked about our almost $200 billion investment in healthcare over the next 10 years. Uh, families are happy, especially those who currently don't have access to dental care because of the high costs of living. Uh, so I'm proud of the fact that Budget 2023 puts out a plan to support families who are struggling to pay the bills uh, with, the, uh, with the grocery rebate, with dental care, with more supports for, uh, for families throughout the budget. I also had a chance to visit with some who are focused on electrification, two companies in particular in my riding who are creating jobs and looking forward to uh, investment tax credits for a greener economy with uh, investments in, in green energy and, and a cleaner future. So um, yeah, it was a good two weeks. I'm glad to be back. We've got a busy couple of months ahead, um, but uh, on behalf of people in Milton, Budget 2023 is a huge step forward for families, for affordability, for green jobs and for health. Can I ask you about Hockey Canada and the government's decision to restore funding to Hockey Canada? Um, Advocates for victims say that the, the government should be requiring Hockey Canada to drop its use of non-disclosure agreements in cases of sexual assault and abuse. What do you think about that? Well, first and foremost, I want to say that, uh, that our government stands with, with victims 100%. And we're here to listen. We're here to, uh, to hear um, and, and recount stories uh, of, uh, of abuse to ensure that we're making the best decisions as possible. Um, on Hockey Canada, I was proud to attend the game last night, the World Championships in Brampton. Um, the women fought really hard. The first two periods were great. And unfortunately, the last 10 minutes weren't great for Team Canada, but a silver medal is worth celebrating any time. Uh, and yes, indeed, our government has uh, starting to take steps forward on reinstating federal funding to Hockey Canada. It's important to note that federal funding to Hockey Canada supports youth programs, supports women's hockey, supports para hockey and sledge hockey. Uh, so it's important to recognize that we don't want any of the, uh, the measures that we've taken to demand accountability and change within the organization to have an impact on players and young people. Um, but I hear you 100%. The, uh, the concerns around, uh, around um, victims being heard are, are well taken. Uh, we've got to make sure, this is, uh, this is well known, I think, the Minister is very, very clear on this, that this is not a blank check to Hockey Canada. It comes with additional accountability measures, additional requests, demands, I, sh I should say, uh, on ensuring that real change is happening within Hockey Canada, because I'm not satisfied, personally, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with, with the, the accounts that we've been hearing with respect to, to culture in hockey from across Canada, whether we're talking uh, about minor hockey, professional hockey, or junior hockey, uh, we still have a lot of concerns, but we're working hand in glove with the organization and always, always listening to victims first. Why not just get rid of NDAs? That's a really good question, and I honestly don't have all of the information necessary in order to answer that question. I'll look into it a little bit more further. I know that there are four stipulations within the reinstatement of the, the financing for, for uh, but for, um, for Hockey Canada. Um, I can personally say that uh, when I was negotiating my own athlete agreement with my national sport organization, uh, we had really good athlete accountability. So we had athlete representatives on the board of directors, and one of the uh, measures that we're looking to put in place in, with respect to governance across the board, all sports, is more athlete engagement, more athlete involvement, and athletes on boards. So that uh, negotiation to ensure that, uh, that players' rights, that athletes' rights are upheld through every step of the process is the utmost importance for the minister and myself and having been on a national team for 18 years and negotiated quite a few athlete agreements myself I can say that uh, the better is possible and we're pursuing that. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Bonjour tout le monde. J'espère que vous allez bien. J'ai passé les dernières deux semaines en traversant le pays, en discutant avec les Canadiens et Canadiennes, le budget. J'ai entendu très clairement des gens qui sont contents avec ce qu'on a fait dans le budget. Et quand même, ils, font, euh, ils ressentent toujours euh, le pain sur l'inflation. Donc, ils veulent vraiment voir notre euh, rabais de l'épicerie. Aussi, ils veulent que le transfert euh, de santé, le transfert rapide, si on peut dire le 2 milliards de dollars, sorte euh, rapidement. Donc, aujourd'hui, je suis ici parce qu'on a déjà déposé euh, ces 46 et on veut savoir très clairement qu'est-ce que les conservateurs vont faire en ce qui concerne aider les gens avec le coût de la vie. Ils ont du temps à étudier ça. C'est quoi la position des conservateurs? Est-ce qu'ils vont appuyer euh, les Canadiens qui en ont le plus besoin ou est-ce qu'ils vont euh, continuer leur ob obstruction farouche à nos mesures pour aider les Canadiens? So, over the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, in different parts of the country talking with Canadians about our budget. They like what they see in the budget. They're also still feeling the pinch of inflation. And so, they've said to me and they've said to our government, look, how quickly can that grocery rebate get out? And we want to see the money get into the provinces and territories for the health top-up quickly. And so today I'm seeking clarification, our government is seeking clarification from the Conservative opposition. Will they support these uh, measures to improve affordability and reduce the cost of living for Canadians? Or are they going to continue to delay and obstruct? And that's, uh, you know, it's an answer and a clarification we'd like to receive in, uh, in very short order. Why, why do you need their support? You have the support of the NDP. Uh, well, we need their support so that they don't obstruct and delay at committee. Canadians who need this money, it's 11 million Canadians who are looking forward to the grocery rebate, need to get that money really quickly. And we've seen in our other budget documents, even the fall economic statement, how long it took to get to third reading because of the obstructionist tactics of the Conservative government. So are Canadians going to have to face Conservative delays again this time? Or are we going to get the money into the hands of Canadians quickly? Are we going to have a delay in it if the public service goes on strike? Well, look, you know that that is a conversation that is taking place right now at the bargaining table, and Minister Forche has been very clear on this, so is the Prime Minister. We're going to continue to work with public sector unions and respect the work that they've done as public servants getting us through the pandemic. We have some, you know, we have some real challenges with, with inflation, but also uh, the economy, and so those conversations are best answered at the bargaining table. Fair, I'm not asking if they're going to go on strike. Right. I'm asking if there will be a delay in the GST rebate if they go on strike. Um, well, that's a hypothetical that you can ask to CRA. We are hoping that there's a negotiated settlement at the table. What do you say to the Canadians who are afraid to lose access to benefits, access to certain services, to become a Grey? I think that's a very good question, and that's why we are axed on the conversation at the table of the negotiation with all the syndicates of uh, the sector private, because it's public, because it's very important to continue the services for the Canadians. And these are the discussions that are now at the table of the negotiation. Madame, you're in charge? L'ultimatum du syndicat de la fonction publique, est-ce qu'il vous inquiète? Moi, je, moi, je pense qu'il y a toujours des tactiques qu'on utilise dans les négociations. Et pour moi et pour notre gouvernement, euh, les solutions vont être trouvées à la table de négociation. Merci tout le monde. Good afternoon. We are here today with uh, Chief Adam of Fort Chippewan. And we are here to respond to the outrageous act of poisoning of land. Uh, waterways uh, in their territory by the leak from Imperial. Big Oil right now made $38 billion last year in profit. They have a legal obligation and a moral obligation to deal with the massive pollution that they have left on Indigenous territory in northern Alberta. The leak uh, in these tailings ponds raises serious questions about the willingness of the Alberta government and the federal government to deal with this toxic contamination. It is outrageous that this illegal dumping leak took place as Minister Guibault was striking from the uh, Environmental Protection Act any reference to overseeing tailings ponds. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that the community are dealing with the poisoning of their land and their waterways while the federal government uh, is considering uh, approving the long-term massive uh, di dumping of this toxic water. And it's not acceptable that companies like Imperial and the other uh, oil sands giants are expecting the public and Indigenous people to, to accept poisoned water as their cost of these companies making profit. They have a legal obligation, they have a moral obligation to fix the damage that they're doing on the territory and there can be no more release of any water without full independent audit. 
of the tailings and a plan to make sure that any water that ever, ever gets back into the Athabasca system is clean and safe for the people. So I want to turn it over to the Chief to uh, give his comments now. Uh, good afternoon. And, uh, you know, what is happening in our community is uh, uncalled for. Uh, we didn't ask for this. We you know we we work together in collaboration of good partnerships. We signed an agreement with you know pretty much of all of industry and in the in the agreement that we were supposed to be truthful and uh, um, outright uh, honest with each other. But in this case, you know, 11 months have gone by, and yet uh, you know we're sad to say that uh, the outcome of this is uh, uncalled for. You know, it's uh, in this day and age, you know, you don't breach an agreement based on the fundamental thing that you could work with the Alberta government, uh, you know, with the AER. I made testimony that the AER, that the First Nations should sit alongside with the AER to give out licenses. Let me correct that thing. I think that the Alberta system, when it comes to the Alberta regulator, is broken, completely broken, and it should be dismantled completely. And that any communities that are affected from downstream of major development, that the community should set up their own panel and hear industry and why they want to come do the activities on their lands. Not be in question and not spend millions of dollars defending our rights under Con Constitutional 35 of the Section Canadian Constitution Act. You know, we should never defend our rights. We should ask the questions in regards to why you want to continue to develop in our region and what safety procedures are you going to take when you're doing these development. And if you can't do the safety, safety measures, then we don't want you in our area anymore. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this very clearly. Canada and Alberta, you left a major footprint of an environmental catastrophe, man-made, in our region, and you don't have a penny to clean it up. Okay. Uh, Chief Adam, can I ask you this question um, from one of my colleagues in Edmonton? Uh, several people who testified today mentioned that there was a lack of federal action on requests for studies, especially on the cumulative health impacts on residents from the tailings ponds. What message does it send to your members that the government has not initiated this work on all these health studies? Well, we've been calling for a health study since 2003 and longer than that in Fort Chip. Um, when I became the chief, I called for a health study at my first go around. I was inside this same building in 2008, coming to the parliamentary committee and talking about the same issue. And it seems like I'm the only person that keeps coming out of Alberta talking about this issue. And if I didn't mention anything about the tailings leak that happened at Curl Lake, who would have said anything? Nobody. So the system is broken. And if Canada wants to change the system, well, then let's overhaul the, let's overhaul the whole Canadian regulatory system when it comes to major development on uh, environmental damages that are causing to the communities downstream. He's talking about creating a working group to try and repair or overhaul the reporting process for these kinds of things. Do you have any confidence that that process is going to, to result in anything positive for your community? The only thing positive to come out of that is that if we have First Nations representatives at the table and given clear direction about where it's going to go, and if the system is broken, then the First Nations are calling for the AAR to cease and dismiss, be gone, completely be gone. We don't need them anymore because they've been rubber stamping the industry for the last 50 years. You called the AER a joke during your testimony. What steps should the Alberta government be taking to make sure that we could trust, you could trust the regulator? I'm calling for the a AER to be dismantled. There's no trust there anymore. Nothing. Not from our community, not from the people that I represent, nor from the people that live downstream from the oil, oil sands industry. And why is it that Chief Adam has to go out and tell the people what goes on? It should have been the AER's job to do this in the first place because they are responsible to tell the public that there is something wrong with the environment because they issued the EPO, Environmental Protection Order, and they've done it three times within Curl Lake in the last year. 
and I've only been notified the last time. And when Imperial Oil says they notified you in May about the leak. They notified us in May that there was a seepage that they don't know if it was tailings pond or not. And they left it at that. Nobody ever contacted us after the fact. Even when they found out that it was a leakage, they still didn't contact us. The only way I found out was through Chief Grand Jam from the, from the Mackay First Nation at the time. And when he notified me at 10.30 at night, something went wrong. Because I don't think it was in the, in the job description of Chief Grand Jam to notify Chief Adam about what had happened two weeks prior. But that was in May that you got that call. In February, it was February 20, 24th is when Chief Grandjam had called me. And I notified my team immediately that night. And next day, we did everything we had to do, but we couldn't do a uh, news release because uh, the budget was coming out for Canada. The budget was coming out for Alberta. It would have took the whole story and we said, we'll just wait it out. Try sitting at home for one week, knowing this whole thing that yeah, I had to bear this in the back of my mind. Just in terms of the timeline, the leak happened in May. In May, it started in May of last year, but you were only notified of February this year by Chief Grand Jam, who is not an official for the Alberta government or a representative for Canada when it comes to that matter. Have you ever had any official notification from the company or from the, the Alberta Energy Regulator? No, only after we broke the story. So even afterwards, they never sent you any kind of. No. They, did, they wish we'd ever broke the story. Was there any explanation from Imperial or the regulator on why some nations were notified and not others, since you heard from Chief Grandjean? I, I don't know why, you know, it wasn't... I can't, ex I can't explain for Imperial. All I could say is that we had an agreement with each other and they breached the agreement. Um, we lived up to the agreement according to the contents that was written inside there. We, are, we behaved... <laughs> We were good neighbors. What kind of impact have you noticed in your community so far from, from this? People are scared. People are scared when they turn that tap on. What am I consuming myself with? It's like I said in my testimony. I went home to Fort Chip. I look at the tap, but I also poured my water to have two cups of coffee in the morning and I cook my food with it. And the last time I left home was uh, three days ago. I boiled wieners and hot dogs or, or craft dinner. You wanna know something? The wieners taste just as good as it did, but I had to eat and I had to use that water. Still in the back of my mind, am I doing something wrong to my health here? Is it time to move the community, you think? Like, is there a feeling within you or among people that you'd like to see the community move or like it's you are asking a biblical question because Moses went through this and it took him 40 years to get to where he had to go to so how long is it going to take if I say we move our community to a safer area that's something you're thinking about that's itself. something that we have to think about and that's the back of our mind and it's the back of our ACFN's mind ever since I became into power because the elders talked about it yet as to what can be done to make to, to give confidence that that water is safe or that other other parts are not uh, being harmed do we have anything and what what do we would we need to get that kind of assurance there's all kinds of researches that are out there already that's that will answer every question that the media wants to put out there everything is being done but because of industry lobbying and doing all their things whatsoever nothing is gets told to the general public the Alberta government also Imperial Oil, but what, where do you think the federal government has fallen short on this issue? Uh, the federal government falls short when they created the province into Dominion in 1905. The reason why I say that is because the province, in our view, does not exist. If Canada wants to continue to run Canada the way it's running today, well then get rid of the provinces because the provinces um, are not recognized under treaty. The provinces don't even recognize our treaty, yet they are governed from Canada to govern over us. 
So when will you have a government that recognizes treaty? And Treaty 8, and all the oil that comes from Treaty 8 is in our territory, and yet we have a government that de denies our existence. Why? The other thing we've asked a couple of times at press conferences are about consequences for the company, like uh, Imperial Oil is still operating that uh, site. They haven't been forced to shut down. There's been very little talk about any financial or hard penalties. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I am the chief of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, and if I spilt a barrel of oil in the Athabasca River or Lake Athabasca, I guarantee you I'll be standing before the judge and probably be sentenced to jail. And that is the truth. I've got a question for Heather, if, if that's all right, Chief. Um, going into the next committee meeting, when you hear from Imperial and later the AER, today you were asking uh, participants what they would ask the regulator in Imperial, what what are you going to be asking? What will the ND what questions will the NDP be posing? Well, you know, first of all, I want to say that the testimony today was horrific. It was appalling. It was appalling that we asked Chief Adams once again to come to this place and once again ask for clean water for his for his people. It's it's appalling that, that we had to re-traumatize again and again and again the the failure of the provincial government to to protect to protect Albertans. The failure of the AER, the failure of Imperial Oil is, is appalling. So I'm going to be asking Imperial Oil to justify what they've done, to give us a timeline, to explain to me why it's been nine months before we heard anything from them. I want to know whether it's stopped. We still don't know if the, if the seepage is even stopped, if they've even done anything to deal with this. I'm going to be asking them how they can stand there and say that this impact doesn't impact wildlife when I've seen the tracks in the area from wildlife. I have a lot of questions for Imperial Oil. I'm going to run out of time, I can tell you that. Um, we've been having hearings about leakages and seepages, but there's also the suggestion that the industry and maybe the province are looking towards release, intentional release of We've about 1.4 trillion or so liters, um, Chief, if you'd like to. And is that the direction you think this is going towards? When you listen to the Premier say that there is no effects in regards to uh, the incident at Curl to the environment, that you could go ahead and eat fish and all this, that there's nothing wrong. We've been living in this area for the last 50 years in regards to when the oil sands was created. You gotta remember the oil sands were starting to be developed in the 50s. It came into operation in the 60s. And uh, the tail and ponds have been leaking ever since then. There are studies after studies that have been followed through that this issue ain't gonna go away. And it will never go away as long as we live. And if we continue to grow the tail and ponds, we are just adding to the problem and we are not solving nothing. that a Notley government could fix this? I have confidence in government if they want to fulfill the necessary need of protecting the environment over with health issues. Uh, we all know that it's important to develop uh, industry because of uh, creation of economic and job wealth. Everybody needs that here in this world today, including us. An elder said to me that your trap line now is the industry because the fishing and the trapping industry is gone. We looked after the wildlife, we plemished, we regrowth, we did all that in the past. Now, if we're gonna become part of the workforce and become part of the industry, our job is to clean it up and to make sure that it's clean. And if we say that there's something wrong, well, there's something wrong. And we want this government and all officials to understand that we do not say bad things about people. We say good things when we wanna do things right. And we're not saying bad things about Imperial because what had happened to their site. 
there are other sites in question that need to be addressed as well. Got to remember, Imperial's only been operating, what, 11 years or so? And if their tailings pond is leaking in after 11 years, how many other tailings ponds are in existence? So I put all of the oil sands in, in, in uh, question. And that's why we say that we need an oversight from the First Nations to sit as the regulatory body and get rid of the AER altogether because they're a useless bunch of group of people that are not doing anything good for Albertans and they're not doing anything good for Canada because if they were, I wouldn't be here today giving uh, testimony or defending ourselves for no reason. Are you confident the Smith government can fix this? <laughs> Danielle Smith was the first comment that came out of her mouth. Go ahead and eat the fish, chief. Everything is good. You have my word on it. Without getting any advice from anybody. You can't. Okay. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks so much to the good folks over at uh, Fort Chippewyan and Athabasca First Nation. It really means a lot, I think, for First Nations right across the prairies to see strong leadership when it comes to the implementation, the follow-through, but also the monitoring of Indigenous rights. It's no secret that Indigenous rights are directly impacted when it comes to development projects. We know from hearing the testimony just throughout committee, but also from the words of Chief Adam, that more needs to be done. It is a catastrophe what's happening in Northern Alberta. Both Heather McPherson, the Member of Parliament for Edmonton, Strathcona, myself and uh, Charlie Angus uh, sit together with First Nations, with uh, leaders from across Alberta, and we talk about some of the things that are need to be seen in terms of how we actually make these things better, how we actually help Indigenous people. We heard, for example, some of the recommendations by Chief Adam, but we need to see this government take Indigenous rights seriously. He mentioned the protections under Section 35 of the Constitution Act. Those protections include the recognition of treaty rights, the recognition that Indigenous people have uh, free, prior, and informed consent. And we have to actually take that seriously if we want to get reconciliation right in this country. We're calling on the government to take reconciliation seriously, meet with the chiefs, understand how this issue is pertaining to, to the, the destruction of land in the north, and fix it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Yeah. Les conservateurs s'attaquent-ils aux institutions canadiennes? Les conservateurs s'attaquent très certainement au quatrième pouvoir, qui est un pouvoir tout aussi important, je pense. Euh, C'est une déclaration qui est très préoccupante, très inquiétante, qui a été faite ce matin. Euh, je dois dire que ça m'a surpris de voir qu'on poussait aussi loin cette rhétorique. Euh, D'accuser CBC d'être un média de propagande, euh, c'est grave, c'est dangereux. Et euh, je m'inquiète de la réaction du public en général à cette affirmation-là. Il est important pour tous, pour les politiciens, pour les parlementaires, mais pour la société en général de bien comprendre le, le rôle des médias, le rôle des médias d'information et de bien comprendre la différence aussi. Ce que je soupçonne, M. Poiliev, de savoir, mais de jouer un peu sur les termes et sur, les sens, euh, sur le sens des mots, euh, la différence entre une télévision d'État et une télévision publique. Alors, de, de voir qu'on qu véhicule ce genre de... de, 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 de mensonge, de désinformation. C'est extrêmement inquiétant, c'est extrêmement préoccupant. Et je serais tenté, et tiens, pourquoi ne pas solliciter l'avis là-dessus, des députés conservateurs du Québec, dont certains sont d'éminents journalistes dans une carrière passée, Mme Vien notamment, M. Deltel. Moi, j'aimerais savoir ce que ces députés-là du Québec pensent de ces affirmations-là. Est-ce qu'ils soutiennent, est-ce qu'ils appuient, est-ce qu'ils endossent ces commentaires-là concernant CBC Radio-Canada? Et je voudrais aussi savoir ce qu'en pensent les régions du Québec et du Canada. Parce que souvent, la télévision publique est le moyen le plus efficace de, euh, de partager l'art, la culture, l'information dans les régions éloignées. Alors, c'est extrêmement dangereux comme jeu. Je ne sais pas où est-ce qu'il veut en venir avec ça, mais c'est certainement déstabilisant. Et je pense que ça devrait, ça devrait sérieusement préoccuper tout le monde. Est-ce que vous craignez des conséquences sur Radio-Canada? Ben, forcément, si, euh, si un jour la menace vient à être mise à exécution de définancer, de retirer le financement à CBC, il y a un impact sur Radio-Canada, c'est certain. Il ne faut pas s'en cacher. C'est pour ça, d'ailleurs, que j'interpelle les députés conservateurs du Québec. Prononcez-vous, dites quelque chose, parce que ça n'a juste pas de bon sens ce qui est en train de se passer là. Alors, oui, il y a des conséquences sur Radio-Canada. Si ça touche CBC, ça va toucher Radio-Canada. Moi, j'aimerais vous entendre pour mes collègues anglophones la première question en anglais, si vous êtes capable de me résumer ça. Vous me la reposer. <rire> Est-ce que c'est une attaque contre les institutions canadiennes, comme le dit M. Trudeau? Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly is a, uh, 
a threat to the fourth power, uh, to the media, which has a very important role to play in democracy. Uh, it's a dangerous game that Mr. Poiliev is, uh, is playing. Uh, he knows quite well what the, what the difference is between a state media and a public media. And we all know that CBC Radio Canada is a public media and not a state media. So he knows it quite well. He uses the, the let's say, the, the, the misinformation, the, 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 the fear, uh, and that fal the, the, this false message uh, could be quite harmful for the media in general. So yes, it's a threat, yes. Je peux vous entendre sur la menace de grève dans la fonction publique. Est-ce que ça vous inquiète au Bloc? Il y a quand même beaucoup de services qui pourraient être menacés par ça. Oui, mais pour l'instant, il, il y a un processus de négociation qui est en cours. Je vais laisser le processus de négociation suivre son cours. On, on souhaite évidemment une solution négociée, on souhaite une entente. Pour le reste, je n'irai pas plus loin dans mes commentaires pour l'instant. C'est quand même un peu inquiétant pour la population. Ah, j'avoue, mais pour l'instant, il y a une négociation en cours. Il n'y a pas de grève officiellement annoncée. Alors, on va faire confiance au processus pour l'instant. Merci. Merci. Merci à vous. Um, je pense que, uh, malheureusement, Elon Musk est tombé dans le piège de Pierre Poilièvre. C'est de, de la désinformation parce que les journalistes de CBC Radio-Canada sont des professionnels. Uh, CBC Radio-Canada est un organisme indépendant, selon la loi sur la radiodiffusion, avec son code de déontologie qui est extrêmement élevé comme critère. Euh, je trouve ça absolument déplorable, puis ça fait des, euh, des parallèles euh, qui sont inacceptables. Donc, j'imagine que, que ça s'applique à Radio-Canada, selon vous. Ben, si justement, ça, ça la même chose. C'est la même chose, c'est la même maison. Euh, mm -hmm. euh, pas avec les mêmes employés nécessairement, ni dans la même langue, euh, mais ça devrait s'appliquer à Radio-Canada. Si on suit cette logique un peu tordue, qui n'est pas la mienne, évidemment. Yeah, I think that uh, Elon Musk uh, fell into uh, the trap of Pierre Poliev, who uh, is uh, at war against CBC, and he's at war against, you know, uh, good information and uh, independent information. And CBC is not a state media, it's an independent organization with professional journalism, uh, uh, journalists, and with a really high level of deontology, uh, you know, um, uh, standards. Why do you think he's going after CBC and not Canada? That's a very good question, I'm not sure about that. Uh, they always said that, you know, they don't want to uh, decrease the funding of Radio Canada, but they want to fund CBC. Um, maybe because Radio Canada is more popular in Quebec, maybe it's going to hurt their chances to win more seats in Quebec in francophone writings. Maybe that's the, the calculation, because otherwise it makes no sense to make this, this false distinction. Merci. Merci. What do, you, what do you think could be done with the river poaching that's going on in Nova Scotia? Well, you know, firstly, I... I understand that shutting down the fishery is difficult for legitimate fish harvesters. And we did everything that we could to make sure that compliance enforcement was beefed up. We doubled it, over 740 uh, enforcement uh, operations. We've had uh, numerous arrests, uh, simply too uh, dangerous for people, as well as the, my concern about the stock, because this is a life part of the life cycle of the american eel and that is a species at risk so um i unfortunately that was the next step i had to take and i apologize for asking a, a personal career question but there are a satirical magazine is publishing thoughts of other liberals are sniffing around at your seat they they're looking to replace you are, do you do you see that as uh, power plays on their part or running again? What do you think? <laughs> well, I, I, what I think is that this is an extraordinary um, opportunity to make changes to how we manage oceans, uh, the fisheries, the Canadian Coast Guard, and I am focused on the job I do each and every day, as well as my representation of the Vancouver Quadra community. And just segueing back to poaching, I apologize, I'm jumping around a bit, but is there is there something the that in what Mr. Perkins is suggesting that can be done? Uh, is it or is it just something that's locally? Uh, local well, he, I, I'm not sure um, if uh, he oh, is yeah. aware that poachers are coming from outside of the Maritimes. They're coming from outside of Canada, 
and it was just a huge escalation of illegal fishery. Um, so it was simply too dangerous to let this continue and we'll have to really reflect on how this fishery is managed uh, uh, for next year. So we now have time to do some uh, consultation and analysis on that, but I was not prepared to take the risk of uh, harm to human life, which was certainly uh, a possibility, and nor am I willing to take a, a risk of the, the undermining of this stock, which is a very important one, and that was also is a risk with poaching. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll send it off to the next question. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. I just got notified yeah. Minister Murray to yeah. stop, and she said she was shutting down that uh, the poaching, the fishery in the rivers to stop poaching. People were coming from all over. It was a safety issue. What, at the nub of what, what your contention is? For, for five years, DFO has not enforced the law, has not arrested poachers, has not seized their assets. The result is every year there are more and more poachers on the river, and I was out on Saturday night after she closed the fishery standing next to poachers on the river. They're continuing to poach and the only people that are off the river right now are the license holders. So the only people that are being harmed by what she's done are the legal license holders, some of whom haven't caught any of the quota. They told the legal license holders they're shutting it down because the poachers got the quota. It's like a different planet to say poachers got the quota so I'm shutting it down so you le uh, you uh, harvesters who are harvesting legally are out of luck. It's just ridiculous and it's all a result of the fact that DFO has refused to enforce the law over the last couple of years. So it's basically done for this year and what we're what you're trying to deal with is... I don't think it has to be done because Elvers still run into June. The minister can reopen the fishery for the legal license holders and enforce the law and make sure that poachers are on the river. And if they are, arrest them and seize their vehicles and pursue legal charges. That can still be done. There's a lot of fishing left. We're only two weeks into the season. The poachers were on the river in March, a month before uh, the season opened, and DFO did nothing to stop them. As a result, thousands and thousands of poachers are now in Nova Scotia still fishing elvers. No, you did a good job. Okay, good. On elvers. Everybody know what an elver is? <laughs> Four years in Acadian, I, I apologize. <laughs> Baby eels, they're about this big, oh, okay, yeah. and they're, they're flown to China and Japan and grown in aquaculture out to full-size eels, and they're $5,000 a kilogram. The most expensive fish there is by weight are elvers, and you catch them with a little net, like you skim your pool with, you can catch that, oh, there's $5,000, there's another $5,000, and that's what's going on. It, uh, no cost, very easy to do. You just stand at the edge of the river as they're running up to migrate. You're not doing this? I'm not well, I could, I could catch my full, my full four year so salary in one week. <laughs> it's crazy. And that's what's going on where you have that kind of cash, you have to have enforcement. If you don't have enforcement, you're going to have poachers, which is what's happened and is still happening. Great. Thank you.